Do you, do you love your characters or do they drive you insane at times? Or Yes. Both? Both, yeah. <laughs> do you, do, I, do, I, do, I do love them, uh, even, even the bad guys. Even the ones I kill. Even part- Ramsey yeah. Bolton. You know, Ramsey's a misunderstood fellow. <laughs> <laughs> what are we misunderstanding? <laughs> he had a hard childhood. <laughs> There's a good excuse. Do you, <laughs> do you like killing your characters? No, I don't. Then but why I, do you do I, it so do, much, George? I, <laughs> I do think it needs to be done. Big fan of death up there, okay. Um. You know, Valar Mogulis, all men must die. Um, I think it's part of life, and, and art needs to reflect life. Um, <laughs> particularly if you're, if you're writing a fantasy novel, an epic fantasy novel, certainly since the days of Tolkien, uh, so many fantasy novels have... Uh, been about war. I mean, there's a war at the center of Lord of the Rings. You know, the Sauron and his his great armies of Arks and and Southlings and Easterlings and and otherlings are all moving out, and uh, um, the free men of the West are fighting against them. And of course, in my in my books, there's a considerably more complicated war going on. But you look at all of the other writers who've been in between, and there's there's wars and wars and wars. Now, I'm not saying you have to write about war. There are many other interesting things to write about. Um, And I've written about some of them. I don't have a war in all my books. But if I'm going to write about war, if any writer is going to write about war, then I want him to treat war honestly. And one thing I, I know about war from people who served in Vietnam and, and served in other wars is, uh, you know, it, it does bring out the beast in men and anybody can die. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're the hero. I think everybody who died in any war th- thought they were the hero right to the moment that the bullet blew off the top of their skull. Um, so it irritates me when, I, when I, I'm watching a movie and or reading a book and the hero is going through incredible dangers, him and his six buddies, and none of them die. You know, maybe one of them gets wounded at some point, uh, but they, they all survive pretty much untouched at the end. I mean, and Tolkien, uh, which I read when I was young and, and at a pretty formative age, I think. That book had an immense influence on me. And it does have some powerful deaths in it. it, it uh, the death of Boromir um, still resonates with me. That was, that was a powerful moment. The death of Gandalf in the Mines of Moria, when, uh, when the Balrog drags him down to uh, the thing, and he says, fly, you fools, and... Uh, that's enormously powerful because, uh, you know, especially at that point in the book, because Gandalf, Gandalf is the father figure. Gandalf is the guy who has the answers. Gandalf is the one who knows what they should do and how they should do it. And suddenly he's gone. Mm. And, the, you know, now the hobbits are on their own with Strider and Boromir and people they don't necessarily trust because their relationships are still fairly new at that point, and they're facing untold dangers, and they don't have Gandalf to warn them of exactly what's around the next turn in the bend. Um, that's a hugely powerful moment, which I actually, if it had been me, Gandalf would have stayed dead, I think. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> You know, bringing him back is surprising, but uh, it, in some ways it undercut the power of that moment. Uh, and by setting up those moments, Tolkien also set me up for the moment where it seemed like Frodo had died. You know, when, when I'm reading the end of the, uh, the Two Towers and Shelob stabs him and he seems to be dead and Sam t- takes the ring and then the book is over, you know, and you have to wait for the next book. Um, I really thought Frodo was dead. I, I thought Tolkien had earned his stripes with me. He had killed Boromir. 
he, he had killed Fred, and now he killed Frodo. My God, I really don't know what's going to happen in this book. Anyone can die. And it became so much more exciting in that point because anyone could die. The peril was real. Mm. And that's the feeling I want my readers to have, that uh, <laughs> if you're going to Fear enter... is the it, feeling you want your readers to have. <laughs> yes, actually. In a, in a word, if, you, if you're going to write about fearful situations, I want... Mm you to have fear, and the right kind of fear. I mean, we, we go on roller coaster rides, and we're scared, right? And roller coaster rides are scary, supposedly, but we're not really scared. We know that we're going to get off the roller coaster after three minutes, and however high we go, and then we plunge down, and there's a certain thrill in a, and I guess an adrenaline rush or something like that. So we like to be scared in certain senses, but... Um, that's one kind of fear, but there's another kind of fear that you feel when, like, you're all alone and you're walking in a bad neighborhood and, and uh, suddenly you hear footsteps behind you and you turn and you see, see some people coming and you don't know who the hell they are. And, you know, that, that's a moment. Or a moment uh, that a soldier or a policeman or anyone fears when they're in a situation where, where their life is on there. On the line. I mean, that's a that's a much more visceral kind of fear, and that's the kind of fear I want the reader to feel. I mean, I think writing is about strong emotions. I want you to to be afraid when uh, I'm putting the characters in a in a scary situation. Uh, when a character dies, I want you to grieve for that character as you would for a friend or uh, a loved one or or a parent. And this entire you know, vicarious experience, which is my goal as a writer. Um, I want you, if I'm going to describe a feast, I don't want to just say, yes, and then they ate a feast. It was delicious. I want, you to, I want you to smell the food and taste the food, whether it's delicious food or bad food or whatever. I smell the, uh, the particular things. If it's a, a joust, I want you to have the excitement of uh, getting caught up in who's going to win the joust. If it's a sex scene, I want you to get hot and bothered. Or <laughs> um, I, I, wanna, I want you not just to read my work, but to live my work. That's, I know they're giving away this book bags here that uh, uh, some of the, I guess it went with the VIP tickets that says uh, a quote I said a couple years ago about a reader uh, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. But I've, I've always felt that. I, I think reading is about vicarious experience. I look back on Tolkien, which I read, like I said, when I was 12 and 13. And I remember things that happened in the book, uh, you know, from half a century later, as if I lived them. I don't remember the actual things that I lived at that time. I, <laughs> I have forgotten who sat behind me in geography class and, uh, you know, what I was doing that June, you know, of, of my 13th year and all that. Uh, so much of this memory is gone, but, but the, uh, the memory of these great books that I read at that time, not just Tolkien, but H.P. Lovecraft, and Robert E. Howard, Robert A. E. Heinlein, um, some of the books I was reading for school and all that, the classics of literature, Dickens and so forth, Shakespeare, th those are very much part of me. Uh, and I think they're part of us all, all of us readers. We absorb this stuff and it shapes us as much as the real events of our real lives. So in that sense, it is real. So, I think for all of us here, you've created something that's done that for us. So thank you very much. Oh, George R. R. Martin. Welcome.